On our honeymoon, my wife and I were lucky enough to take a trip to Europe where we got to visit a lot of sites and cities that were important, especially to us as Catholics. And one of those stops included the cathedral in Pisa, Italy, which is known for its proximity to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Now, if you're part of a tour group like we were, when you arrive at these local destinations, they will usually have a local tour guide who will then take you around and tell you about all the interesting facts about the locale and its history and important people and important places and things like that. And as tourists, we don't really know anything about the area. We presume we don't know anything compared to what the local tour guides have. So there's this incredible amount of trust and this benefit of the doubt that we give them because we know nothing and they have the supposed knowledge and then we allow them to fill us up with that information. So on this particular occasion, the tour guide was taking us around and explaining the typical things about a cathedral's construction and the cast of characters that were involved in it. And then he slipped in something that I was so shocked by that I didn't have the wherewithal to protest as I wish I could have looking back on it. He said that over the course of the history of the cathedral's construction, the church taught that women didn't have souls. And that's why among all the important people he was describing, it was mostly men involved in its construction, which was of course met with a chorus of gasps and outrage from his dutifully attentive audience. And this claim was so hilariously absurd because as he said it, we were standing underneath a dome, which included this fresco of a heavenly vision, which included multiple female saints in heaven. And it made me wonder, is this something that he just made up for some prejudice or hatred of the Catholic church, which isn't that uncommon? Or is this something that he just heard sometime and then complacently recited as if it were a fact? Either way, the fact that he was able to recite this claim without any opposition and that everyone there just took it at face value is indicative of the fact that we all have this vague idea that Western civilization's more Christian heritage depicts a society that was patriarchal and misogynistic and that had conquered and replaced previous and older societies that were much more in tune with honoring the role and place of women in society. It leaves us with this impression that human society naturally trends towards equality within the sexes and that Christianity uh, interfered with that sequence and led to unnatural outcomes where men were able to advance and women were treated as second-class citizens. Now, it may surprise you to learn, as I'm embarrassed to say, it surprised me when I learned this, that there has never been a matriarchal society in the entire history of human civilization. There are zero records of a society or a civilization in which women played the lead role. Everywhere, in every place, and in every time that we have records for, men have assumed the dominant positions of power. Like we're not even talking about most of the time, like as if it were 80% of the time men dominated and maybe 20% women. In every case, it was 100% men and 0% women. Now, as much as many people will lament the situation in society today, we do have to admit that it's not, that balance of power isn't quite so lopsided anymore, that women definitely do have more of a say and more rights and do occupy positions of power, uh, whether it be in government or in industry or whatever which means that at some point in human history, especially in the West, there had to have been some deliberate relinquishing of power that men had because that doesn't naturally occur on its own. If human society is allowed to just do whatever it wants and let the chips fall where they may, then men will always assume those dominant positions of power. So for women to have ever made strides towards having a say in how society conducts itself, it must have involved a, again, that relinquishing of power and men looking to women to have their say. And that is in fact what happened. And as hard as it will be for so many people to believe, and so I ask you to suspend some of your prejudices here, we actually have the Catholic Church to thank for that. Even if our understanding of the Middle Ages is riddled with inaccuracies and prejudices, which it is, one thing that we do tend to get right based on our broad impressions of it is that the Middle Ages, especially the early Middle Ages, were, was a very violent period compared to what we in modern Western civilization are used to. And this is because the ruling class, the nobility, was actually a military class. And since that was something of a vocation for them to be trained in martial society, they found it almost irresistible to find reasons to fight each other. A lot. 
So the church, who is never one to simply go along with fashions and trends of the day, wanted to frustrate these inclinations among Europe's elite. So they started by promoting a peace movement. In fact, this is the first peace movement in all of human history called the Peace and Truce of God. And among all of its various demands, chief among them was protections for non-combatants, such as women and children, especially uh, widows, um, for the clergy, and also for the peasant class. And while this movement did enjoy a lot of success, it didn't produce the full effect of what the church wanted. And this is where we might say the church was way ahead of its time because we say things all the time like if women ruled the world, then there'd be a lot less war and violence, right? Well, that's pretty much what the church thought as well. And so they continued to push the progression of this peace movement into what eventually became known as the chivalric code or what we know as chivalry. And instead of enforcing this code of behavior through laws and legislation, they promoted it through medieval literature, especially works like Geoffrey of Monmouth's Tales of King Arthur. Monmouth was a Catholic cleric who wrote about an idealized brotherhood of knights who used their resources and aptitude for combat in the service of others and in the cultivation of virtue rather than for selfish ends like the acquisition of wealth and land. And this new code of behavior placed an especially high premium on the deference of behavior to the genius and sensibilities of women. Devotion and honor towards women was at the heart of chivalric code. This meant that if lords or castellans were inclined to resolve some dispute violently, that they should first consult and honor the wisdom of their wives or ladies in court. And that if violence was inevitable, that it should be conducted in an honorable and civilized way. And in a world where women didn't have a say in governance or politics or basically anything at all, this was a revolutionary shift towards a world in which the wisdom of women would be heard and capable of balancing out the sensibilities of men. Now, maybe you're inclined to look at that and say, well, that didn't go far enough. Women still don't have the same rights that men have, and maybe you've got a point. But the point that I'm making is that if it's accurate to say that at a certain point in history, men exclusively controlled the government, the economy, and the military, and they don't anymore, then what changed? How did that happen? Because if that's the position that they were in and they were wholly interested in preserving their power and control, then how is it that women have become so much more influential today? I would argue that it's because of the residual effects of chivalry and the fact that for generations and centuries, men have had it hammered into them that they should listen to the wisdom of women. And that this is something that would have never happened because it didn't ever happen prior to this new foothold that women were given because of the chivalric codes. Thank you so much for watching that. I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you got something out of it. And if you did, and you wanna consume more content like this, then please consider subscribing to my channel. Or if you saw this on Facebook, then like my page and follow along. If you're on YouTube, it's not enough anymore to subscribe because YouTube wants to think that it can tell you what you should watch instead of what you actually want to watch. So in this case, you actually have to hit that little bell to be notified as to whether or not I've uploaded something more recently. So please subscribe and hit the bell at the same time that really helps me out a lot and if you could consider sharing this among your social network that helps me a lot too and if you want to support the making of these videos please consider supporting my business which is a communications and strategic marketing company who specializes especially in branding and web design and this is especially catered towards ministries and apostolates and parishes we have a parish web design system that we've built specifically for parishes and churches that is affordable but also beautifully packaged and easy to use. So if you're interested in that, check out my business, which is holdsworthdesign.com and hit the contact uh, button in the navigation and get in touch and, and we can figure out if there's a good fit for you there.